Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Andrew Janoway. I'd like to talk to you about my Nuffles study, which had a working title of London 40 Miles and is a study of farm business diversification near cities. First and foremost, I'd like to thank my sponsor, the John Oldacre Foundation, for their generosity and for the freedom they afforded me in the scope of my topic. I'm very grateful to them and the Nuffield Farming Scholarships Trust for what has been a fantastic experience. I would also like to extend a very special thank you to my family for their encouragement, love and support during the past year or so. You knew that was going to go well. Um, I farm in Hampshire uh, and London 40 miles is a reference to how far our farm is from central London. Uh, we are prime commuter belt, have a rush hour at the end of the farm drive and have a local population who are increasingly intolerant of the activities of farming. However, I have been wondering for some time whether I had been becoming slightly cynical and negative uh, about my location and where we farm and shouldn't instead be trying to seek, focus on positives and wonder whether a Nuffield scholarship might just help me do this. Our farming business, like many of you in the audience, is based largely on commodity production. Our, main, our two main outputs are wheat and processing potatoes. This graph shows the ex-farm wheat price from the year I started farming in 1996. Now I do not expect you to pour over for too long, but what I would like to highlight is the vast fluctuations we've had in recent years in the ex-farm wheat price. Now I find it very, very difficult, as I'm sure other wheat producers here do, to run a business with such swings in prices. It makes budgeting and planning and capital expenditure very, very difficult. Just out of interest, the, um, the 1996 price shown here in today's values would be £176 a tonne. Now of course I don't want to just ruin the morning for wheat producers. <laughs> Here are the uh, 12 month uh, changes for other commodities. Um, all seed raping seed has fallen 22%, uh, beef has fallen by 11%, and, and lamb by 8%. Um, and we, I think all dairy producers are pretty aware of what's around the corner for them. Um, now, historically, and this is certainly how my father grew our business, um, the vagaries of commodity production could be combated by. Um, increasing acreage, growing physically, and trying to achieve economies of scale. However, I no longer feel that this is a viable alternative for farmers. This colourful little chart shows um, how farmland prices have increased sharply in recent years. Farmland prices are shown here in red, and as you can see, have outperformed central London property prices, the FTSE, in recent years. In fact, only the price of gold has increased more than farmland. Um, it's worth pointing out the red line represents an increase of 187% um, over the last 10 years in, in farmland values. I can see the challenge now for farming businesses is to increase income from the existing physical base and not to be too re reliant on commodity production. And so this became the basis of my Nuffield Travels, to study businesses that had diversified away from commodity production, establish new income streams, and particularly where this has happened in areas of population. I started my travels in New York City, and whilst I met some very interesting farmers there, the most impressive, impressive thing I came across was Grow NYC, a not-for-profit, government-funded organisation that seeks to promote locally produced food and healthy eating within the city. Now it's, now it's sought to achieve this by implementing four distinct programmes. Green markets. Green markets are the city's farmers' markets, and Grow NYC runs 54 separate ones each week, involving 250 local farmers. I found the markets to be vibrant, colourful, colourful affairs, and very well attended. I was particularly struck by how many chefs were using the markets to buy fresh produce on a daily basis. Uh, green Market Co. picks up where the green markets let off and seeks to link the larger producers in the state with the larger consumers in the city. Essentially, Green Market Co. acts as a wholesaler, supplying the city's restaurants, schools, hospitals and government buildings with local produce. I think the minimum order was $250. Because of its high volume customers, Green Market Co. has become a very realistic and appealing outlet for the larger scale producers that I spoke to. 
Personally, I was really impressed by this initiative and I would love to see such an organisation doing the same sort of thing in London and other cities in the UK. Sorry. Fresh Food Box is a box scheme that runs from July to November across the city. It is particularly aimed at improving the diet in the city's poorer neighbourhoods. Each box contains between seven and nine um, items of fruit and vegetables and costs $10, which represents the wholesale price of the items within the box. However, I understand that the retail value um, of the items would be nearer $26. In essence, farms still receive the normal farm gate prices for their products, while, the, cap while the, the city carries the cost of collating the products and packing and delivering the boxes. I re again, I really like this idea and wonder whether it might work here with perhaps large business being involved in sponsoring the scheme, perhaps HSBC, and uh, <laughs> helping to meet packing costs and distribution. Oh, you'll consider it. Um, um, and lastly, Farm Roots. Um, farm Roots is a free technical <coughs> advice facility open to grow NYC members and uh, offers quite a range of expertise from legal planning issues through to uh, management and bookkeeping tuition. Whilst in Australia, uh, I visited Kangaroo Island, which is off the coast of South Australia. The island is about 100 miles long and about 50 miles wide at its widest point. Historically, farms on the island would have been involved in land and wool production. But depressed prices have meant that farmers have been forced to consider new income streams. This gentleman here is Zach Trethaway and can be seen here boxing up live marron, a type of large fresh water crayfish that he produces. They're highly regarded across Australia as a delicacy and a slightly more affordable alternative to lobster. Now the interesting thing here was that it suddenly became apparent to me that there need be proximity to a city um, that allows such diversifications to take place. Because Kangaroo Island has a busy little airport with regular flights across to the mainland. And actually, it was Zach's proximity to a good transport link, the airport, that had allowed his diversification to flourish. This slide shows John Coleman, a, a dairy farmer in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which is about four hours from New York, and he's marking out a maize maize. In the face of falling milk prices, John had been designing and growing maize mazes and opening, the, opening them to the public since 1996. However, when I visited him, it was what I saw going on in the background of this slide, that, of this photograph, sorry, that really interests me. During successive winters, John, using his farm staff, had built an enormous venture play park. Each activity within the park was designed to challenge visitors and their children, either physically or mentally. It was the first time I had come across this concept, and I immediately thought of my old marketing lectures and dear Professor Hughes, Hughes banging on about unique selling points or something or other. Um, it seemed that John had stolen a march over the super adrenaline fuel theme parks closer to New York by uh, offering parents in a country plagued by obesity uh, a unique environment in which children would have to apply themselves. <coughs> Los Osos, California is in the heart of America's salad and vegetable growing area and is characterized by, as you can see here, large field scale production and intensive irrigation. However, amongst these large farms, I visited, I visited Bloom Microgreens run by Cara Woods. Microgreens are essentially the seedlings, the seedlings of, um, sorry, seedlings of plants that are harvested at between nine and 21 days of growth at the first two true leaf stage. A huge range of plants can be grown as microgreens, but those that work best are those with intensive flavor or color. I saw Cara growing coriander, basil, fennel, broccoli, and peas amongst others. And I must say, I was really impressed and particularly surprised how much flavor such a juvenile plant can carry. Microgreens are either eaten on their own in what Americans call a gourmet salad or added to larger leaf cheaper salads to boost flavor and color. Clearly what micro, Bloom Microgreens had here was a niche market and it was interesting to hear from Cara how she had actually had to create this niche. When she started growing microgreens, they were pretty unknown in the States and she had to spend much of her time creating a demand for a product that, cost, that consumers and restaurants didn't know they needed. However, cold, However, ultimately, Cara's hard work had paid off, and Bloom Microgreens can be found in many of the finest restaurants in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. 
As I travelled, I tried to use the financial calculation return on capital employed as a performance indicator for any particular diversification. Now, while most diversifiers were purely focused on maximising revenue, the cores, the core family at Lorksmont Farms on the US East Coast had diversified very successfully, had diversified very successfully, but concentrated on minimising their capital outlay at all times. The core family had bought the, bought the grassland estate from a wealthy New York industrialist who, during his ownership, had, create, had commissioned the famous New York architects Delano and Aldrich. Um, yeah, I haven't heard of them either, but anyway, uh, to design and build um, a series of unique structures on the estate, um, including Japanese sunken gardens, um, Italian style piazzas, and this beautiful building, the Rotunda. The cause had originally run a large beef enterprise on the estate, but in the face of falling domestic beef prices, had developed a very clever alternative use for their 700 acres of grassland, and were now offering stabling, grazing, and training facilities for the very active and very wealthy polo set on the East Coast. Not content with this, the family had in recent years be begun to utilise the existing unique architectural structures on the estate and had turned four of them into wedding venues. I was told they can ho host four, four weddings simultaneously and I was particularly impressed by how the focus had been yet again on minimising capital outlay. For example, caterers were expected to bring their own mobile kitchens, restrooms were hired in, um, and even the horse-mounted car park attendants that the venue's famous for were grooms for the rest of the week. I'd like to leave you with three or four points to consider, if I may. Um, firstly, I'm not suggesting that diversifying your business would make the strains and stresses of commodity production disappear. But I would like to suggest you all consider developing new income streams to broaden the base of your business. Secondly, don't be as naive as I was when I started my travels. Proximity to a city is not the be all and end all. Proximity to good transport links can be just as vital. I have also listed here four features or characteristics of the most successful businesses I came across. And I'll leave you to read them, but without a shadow of doubt, the, the, the quality you must have is enthusiasm. And lastly, of course, a quote, without which um, an Uffield lecture is just a lecture. And uh, I love this one from Henry Ford, and I think it's very, very apt. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. Thank you. <laughs>